Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel. I'm a draftsman and also the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 84, and I will have this conversation with artist Stephen Russell Black. If you would like to support my channel, liking and sharing, liking and leaving a comment and sharing this video is incredibly helpful and so is subscribing. These are all immediate and free to do. If you'd like to support my channel with money, you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website. You can buy things that I make on eBay. You can buy prints of my drawings or you can leave me a tip. These uh, funds help keep the channel and my art going. Very helpful. These are uh, all the links for these things that I just mentioned will be in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening and enjoy the episode. Thank you for your time. Okay, Stephen Black, welcome to a conversation about art. You are episode 84. Please tell our future listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Stephen Russell Black. I'm a painter in the Bay Area, and I mostly do my own fine art, but I also work for clients like Magic the Gathering uh, mm. for Wizards of the Coast doing uh, the trading card art, and then I also uh, paint covers for Image Comics. Okay. The covers specifically, not the, like, the panels themselves? No, I um, as of yet, I haven't done interiors, but I'm actually working on an interior job. So, okay. so far, I haven't done sequential, like, the interior pages, but I just paint covers for them. Okay. No, I, I didn't, I didn't know, though, I guess it makes sense, you know, that there would be, in some occasions, at least, a different person to do that. But I kind of thought the artists themselves, I mean, the artists that does the, illust the, the drawings of the sequences of the comic would also do the cover sometimes, right? Uh, most times, but um, <clears throat> lately there's a trend of these variant covers where they have specific artists that just ah, do cover, just do cover art. So, okay, that sounds yeah, yeah that sounds like a fun like a, that I would leave like a collector type. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So, all right. So you said you did you also say fine art like your you know your own. I do. Art? So, um, you know, I mostly make my own like drawings and paintings that I sell myself and direct you know direct market to the consumer. Um, and then I also show in a few different galleries, um, but mostly I just just sell off of my website. Okay, so then there's so then there's fine art where you do, uh, you know, what I guess is the tr traditional fine art uh, drawings and paintings, and you do the the comic covers. And sorry, <laughs> sorry, what else did you say? That's oh, I also work for Wizards of the Coast. It's a company. Out oh, of, the uh, yeah. Middle for the trading card game Magic: The Gathering. Yes, yes, okay, and and okay, so for that one. Do you do digital type uh, I don't. art? Or? I paint oh. everything. As you can see behind me, everything is like uh, oil paintings. Um, and everything I do is traditional. So yes. it starts as a little, <clears throat> a little pencil sketch or a charcoal sketch. And then um, I show that to my art director and they approve it or make changes. And then we scale it up to a, a larger painting, like a 16 by 20 or a 24 by 36, like large scale painting. And then I, uh, I paint that and that gets approved and that gets photographed and cleaned up and turned in. And um, so eventually, everything is just a digital file that gets sent out to someone. But I prefer to to paint on an actual um, traditional traditional oil painting. So it's like I, I like the relicness of it. I like having this object that um, someone's like labored over. That's like mm -hmm. you know, I can I can show off. And then and then there's also a secondary benefit of that is that we sell the original Magic card art right. um, for quite a bit. So um, it's it's part of the uh, whole business plan. Okay. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, cause I really like that. I mean, is that also called concept art? Is that called concept art? Well, concept art would be for, um, <clears throat> um, there are artists that do concept art for magic. They would be the people who do the prelim sketches, planning, planning out the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but concept art could be anything. It could go to, um, I actually did concept art for a comic book at one point, uh, designing the villains, uh, for someone, but usually it's the video game or a uh, movie industry where you're, you're designing characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. A lot of that is digital too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I it's just, just that... I'm just an old curmudgeon that happens to like, I just love oil painting. So I, but yeah, it's just that, I guess, I guess in my, I mean, I haven't looked into that 
um, field, I guess, really that much, even though I like it because, uh, but I mean, the reason for which I haven't looked into it really that much is because I have the perception that um, it, it it's like, you know, as of late, it has to be like in a digital art type thing because uh, it's, you know, the playing it on the PC or whatever. Yeah. Um, but so, so then why do you get away with doing it as a paint, like as a oil painting and then having it photograph in this stuff versus it's like, have you, is it because you've been there very long or like before oh, because I, was introduced or what? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I started my uh, traditional art career way before all that stuff like took over. Um, and so the art directors who hire me now just know that's how I work. Mm -hmm. and, um, if I, I did actually do a combo cover digitally once because we had a super tight deadline. Yeah. And so for that one, and just instead of painting, um, I did a sketch and it got approved and I did a final drawing. And then I just took the final drawing into Photoshop and uh, just did a paint over um, in Photoshop and turned that in as a final. And um, they actually couldn't tell the difference. So okay. um, that worked out. But I just, I prefer doing it the other way. Now there's a lot of drawbacks. Um, okay. If and the reason for the digital stuff is that it's very quick and there's lots of changes. When you do stuff in concept art, you're making it lots of iterations. So if you're saying it's like, it's a lion creature, so you would draw like several lion creatures and then they go, okay, that's great. Now do five that are like this or change mm -hmm. this or add this. And so if you're working digitally, you make all those changes very quickly. You can make iterations very fast. Um, me working as a traditional artist, I have to keep drawing over like, you know, erasing yeah or if i get changes in my uh painted work that's like hours and hours and hours of you know sanding down and repainting on top of and that kind of stuff but i'm willing to put up with that because i just i love oil painting so mm -hmm. okay but but are there any does the oil paint uh procedure like that method does it have anything over the digital one does it have anything anything that is superior to the I mean, besides, you know, like if you can try to think of benefits that it has besides your own bias of just liking oil oh. paint more, you know? So, you know, just strictly a financial decision is that because I make an oil painting, um, like the first magic card I did for Wizards, uh, we sold the original for $10,000. Mm. Um, that was a nice payday. Right. Um, so if I had done that digitally, there'd be no physical painting to sell. So I cut that payday out of my out of my workflow. Right. Um, I could I could achieve things faster and maybe do work on more projects because mm -hmm. uh, because of the speed um, I would be able to do more projects, but I wouldn't be able to have that original to sell. And um, and I just come from a background of like just really loving that traditional like relic of a piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. So then when the original painting gets sold, I mean, do you split that with the Magic the Gathering, the gathering no. people or is it all yours? You sell, you no, sell it on your own? Yeah. Uh, I okay. sell it through an auction on um, uh, Facebook. I see. Okay. 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 Um, yes. Okay. So, all right. So then if you're, you know, if you're able to manipulate an image, you know, by scanning it and then fill finagling it on Photoshop. So then, I mean, what is your familiarity with digital media? Do you, I mean, oh, so I worked as a graphic designer for like 10 years. So I was already working digitally. So just the last thing I want to do in my personal work or, or the, the work for myself is spend more time on the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, so while I was being like, while I was working as a designer, I was also building my, my fine art career mm -hmm. um, and making paintings at night and in the morning before I went into the work. Um, so, but it, at my day job, I was already doing lots of digital work so okay and have you tried the tablets and uh, like procreate whatever this type of stuff that tries to emulate yeah. traditional media yeah procreate's great um uh photoshop is pre pretty much everybody's default you know you have like a wacom tablet um mm -hmm. and you're you're drawing on the side next to your computer um i still use that for all of my like when a photograph or when a painting gets photographed it comes back and there are lots of little flaws and imperfections from the way it gets photographed with the light so i'm still spending time uh, in Photoshop, cleaning them up and adjusting color and thing like that to make them look just like the oil painting. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but for a digital artist, uh, Procreate's fantastic to just watch. Like you could complete an entire assignment or um, illustration job just in Procreate. It's, it's it works just great. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. great for sketches too. Like I'll I'll actually take a, if I'm un if I'm unfamiliar or like or unsure of a color palette that I want to use for a piece, mm -hmm. I'll take my traditional um tone paper drawing that i do and i'll scan that in and then i'll drop it into procreate 
And in a color layer on top, you could try out all different kinds of palettes. Like, oh, I'm going to make an orange painting. I'm going to make a purple painting. I'm going to make a, you know, you can try things out before you commit to doing them in oil. Mm -hmm. So I'll do lots of little color studies and procreate uh, before I do a final, final painting. Okay. Um, okay. So why do you think, why are you so biased in favor of the traditional media? Oh, it's just what I like. Just so the only personal preference is just, it, it makes me happy. It's fun for me. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it, I don't have a higher like moral ground or anything over it. Uh, I think digital is great, um, but I just enjoy painting, so. Yes, okay. So, all right, so when, uh, hmm. all right, give me a second. Um, so, okay, so what is it about painting in oil paint? That yeah, you... so that I like so much? Yeah. Um, I, I like, so the, the, the most thing is that um, that's how I, how I learned. Mm -hmm. So all the people that I looked up to were either acrylic or oil painters. Mm -hmm. um, and it was very important to go see these, like, these things, in, you know, getting to see them in person. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you're a digital artist, like, you know, you're just seeing that JPEG or TIFF file, like, online is the only way you ever experience it. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, like, almost the religious experience of seeing an original painting in person and seeing all the layers and actually seeing the thing yeah. that someone, yeah. like, labored over with all, you see all their little marks and, like, yeah. sometimes even literally their fingerprints. And um, I, it's just, like, it's a whole different experience. So mm -hmm. it's kind of okay. like seeing... Uh, Kind of like seeing live music yeah and yeah. like just listening to a, a cd or or a mp3 file right it's mm -hmm. like there's just something different about seeing seeing a band in person so the only time we really get that as as artists i think is like having a an, a traditional piece that people can come and experience like hey this is the actual thing i labored over um so mm -hmm. okay i mean um i i agree with you i draw with just pencil and paper and that's that's my main medium um and I have tried, you know, I've fiddled with the, um, I, uh, you know, my husband got a tablet that, you know, he, he found one and he was like, hey, you should try this, you should learn, you know, get used to like, uh, these, just these other tools. And I mean, I agree with that as well, you know, having the familiarity and knowing something about them and whatever, just like knowing that they exist and this stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I just have a difficult time seeing past my own bias of just how much I like the medium itself. It's like, I like paper. I like the fibers of the paper and I like the tooth of the paper and the friction sure. and the friction between the paper and the tip of the pencil, <laughs> you know, like this type of stuff. And um, uh, I also have a difficult time uh, getting over, I mean, getting over, I suppose in quotes, I'm not sure if that's the right expression for that, but getting over the fact that with a drawing, there is a drawing there. Uh, mm -hmm. Versus if you have a digital file, it, I mean, I mean, in, I feel like that file is not anywhere <laughs> it, because right. it's, um, you know, it's somewhere within the device, within the computer or something, but I can't see it in person in a way, right. you know, so uh, I just, I find that a uh, mental, uh, a difficult mental, mental hurdle over which to get over, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, once you, once you sell a drawing though. <clears throat> um, you're left with only your digital file as your memory right. of the piece. So, yeah, no, no, absolutely for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean that's. Um, but I think I think that's kind of part of the experience of of having the physical object. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you. I mean, not that I have children, so I don't actually know. But you know, if you make a child, you spend your time with the child, and then the child has supposed to leave, right? And then you have like pictures of the kid or something, you know. It's mm -hmm. kind of like that, no? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you have children. Oh, sure. And people ask you, like, um, you know, are you sad when a painting leaves? Or are you sad when, like, a you know, a favorite drawing or painting leave? And I'm always trying to make, like, the next piece be the most, um, like, important or, like, the best thing I've ever made. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a month after I create them, sometimes even a week after I create them, like, all I can see are the flaws. Mm -hmm. So... I'm, I, I I don't have that sadness of, of something going. Now, there was a lot, an octopus piece that I recently uh, finished that was really important to me. And I, I traveled around with it for a year, like showing it at different um, pop-up festivals and things. And that finally sold this year. And um, so that one was a little 
a little sad because I the next show I did after that I was like oh I don't have that with me like <laughs> I can't you know I can't show it off um, but I got to show it for a year before it finally sold and so it was really nice to get for that many people to get to see it and experience it in person and that was really special um, but yeah but mostly you're trying the the next piece that you're working on should be like the most amazing thing you've ever you know made mm -hmm. and so is is that is that like your uh, mindset i guess when you're making work it's like this one is this one's going to be the best thing i've ever made each time i think so i think that's what you you have to do i think that's the um cuz otherwise if you if you made something and you're like this is the most amazing thing ever well then you'd quit cuz you you're like you're done like mm -hmm. you made you did the thing mm -hmm. um and i'll often come back i think a lot of artists come back to the same kind of theme um but i'll come back to the same character multiple times like I have a piece behind me that's like a a woman's head that's kind of like breaking open with like a snake coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done that image a couple different times in different ways. And I don't think I've ever gotten it like just right. So I've, I keep trying it a couple of times, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. But I think that the, every piece you're working on currently is like the mindset should be to try to make it the most amazing thing you've ever done. Mm -hmm. yes. Or at least somehow, at least, at least, at least somehow, um, do something better or just reach a little farther than you had before. Because mm -hmm. um, you're not, you know, you're never going to reach the top of the peak, like in a single piece. But if I can just do something a little better than I did last time. Okay, so what does that constitute to, to make the, uh, the next piece superior to the previous one? It's like, what does that mean exactly? Oh, so you'd have to break it down into manageable steps, right? Um, so it's like um, design wise, like, is it a good design? Like, is, mm -hmm. did you like lay out the page? Well, like, could you have done it better? Um, lighting wise, did you, you know, was the was the lighting right? Did you get it? You know, the thing you were going for or uh, anatomy, you know, of the of a figure? Like, mm -hmm. could I, you know, I, I drew a, like, this is the third time I've done like kind of a snake piece. So it's like, you know, in the previous ones, like, what did I want to try to improve on? Like, was it, is it the anatomy of the snake? Is it a feeling? Is it a, you know, you'd have to, it'd be, there'd be lots of different categories that you could break down and say, um, I didn't hit this last time and mm -hmm. I want to make sure I do that this time. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking, especially in paintings, I'm always looking for a, a sophisticated palette um, that's not, doesn't like hit you over the head with like, um, this is a red piece or this is a, you know. That I want them to be like more complex than that. Mm -hmm. um, and the color is like a super emotional, like kind of key, right? Like, especially when you watch movies and they'll, they'll key different scenes to a certain kind of, kind of color palette mm -hmm. and um, the color can do so much. And so uh, one of the things, especially I focus on in the paintings is um, did I get the right kind of color palette to say the thing that I was trying to say with the drawing in the first place? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there'd okay. be lots of little things you can improve at each time um, and you're not going to get them all right. And uh, you'll probably fail at most of them because uh, just we're human. And uh, but um, if you can just like you focus on one thing that's a little victory, like, oh, man, like in this one, like that lighting that I did was just like so good. And mm -hmm. like, you know, each time I just try to get better. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, uh, yes, I'm, I'm curious about this mentality, I guess, surrounding the 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 current work that one is working on, because I'm not sure that I, that I myself necessarily think about that when I'm working on a current piece of work. Um, even though, even though I definitely kind of want to get the work to a certain point in the sense that it, it, it feels like it has to look a certain way uh, the work itself. And I kind of like, as I'm working on it, it's like the, the drawing is kind of telling me in quotes in a way, uh, you know, like this interaction between me and the work, uh, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing it progress into something as I draw on it. And I'm like, all right, so now I need to do this. And I kind of want this shadow to look this way and I need to make this darker, you know, so I, I kind of feel like that in that dialogue, um, between me and the work almost doesn't allow for room to think about what the previous work had that I need to make better in this one. So, <laughs> so, you, so you see it more like, um, to think of it in a very abstract way, uh, you think of it in terms of like uh, your last piece was a relationship just specifically with that piece and how can the new piece like uh, is about that relationship and so why would you consider uh, something previously in a new relationship uh, kind of a way. But I think um, 
you are are better each time though, right? Like like you bring right, something yeah. new, new to it because you bring something new to each each piece yeah. because you learned something last time uh, that you do a better job of. And you're going to be more giving to the to the like to to frame it in the context of how you set it up. Um, the p you start working on a piece and the piece kind of tells you what it needs, mm -hmm. but you learned a lot of techniques from the last piece. And so when this piece tells you it needs a certain thing, you're going to be better at doing those things and providing those things for it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that makes you better like each time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense because even though, even though, you know, you, you one can argue that, you know, maybe you, you know, you or, or I, maybe whomever, an artist with experience is arguably good at what they do because they're continuing to draw or paint they are still getting better yeah you know even if it isn't necessarily as obvious as uh the rate at which the artist was getting better at the beginning but one is still getting better at you know the practice of drawing or painting so that makes a lot of sense that even if not consciously the current piece is still arguably superior to the previous one just kind of by default just because like you yep. have that much more experience. Does that seem right? Yeah, I think so. And even if that even if that means um, not technically better, but like you got better at expressing the emotion you were trying to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to express. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay, I'm curious about what you said about the palette being sophisticated, the, um, the color palette being sophisticated because well, as I said, I'm a draftsman, so I, I'm not that familiar with color. I know yeah. that like uh, complementary colors and uh, that's about it. That's like a, <laughs> about the color theory that I know. Sure. So I'd like it if you went a little bit into that about well, you know, how, how you manipulate the color palette. Yeah, so you'd start you'd start with like uh, drawing is light and dark, right? And then um, things that are more contrasty come forward. Things that are less contrast move back. Mm -hmm. uh, things that are lighter come forward. Things that are darker move back. Those are those are kind of like your beginning building blocks, right? Um, then there's dominant, sub, subdominant, subordinate in terms of like uh, size of different things next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then things just get more and more complicated like from there. So then when you start to introduce color, you go for, you you still have to think about light and dark, but now you have the, um, and what really feels like a sophisticated palette very quickly is um, a trick that's very, very quickly is um, your saturation of color, right? So, because when you're drawing in black and white, you're only talking about like, um, it's like, kind of you have the value scale but really you have like a dark object a light object and then you have this like middle ground so maybe you have three you have a light a medium and a dark and then everything's kind of a shade in between mm -hmm. but you have to focus on those light medium and dark to really make things pop in a drawing mm -hmm. um and then your gray like everything you you muddle with in the grays is is a more sophisticated thing in a drawing right like it's it's the stuff that's very subtle and um and so then in painting um you're still having that light and dark, but then you're having like um, really bright red, a very neutral red, a more bluish red, a more orangish red. Like there's, there's now you can pull instead of this scale that just goes up and down of light and dark, you can pull to the sides of more saturated, less saturated, um, more warm compared. And then it's and then you're also doing things where um, those are all relative terms, because if you have like a very uh, neutral red, it's only as neutral as the color you stick it next to. Mm -hmm. So things become more complicated, like the more the more notes and things you're trying to hit. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I always well, try to have the the overall. So when I, you know, I start every painting as a drawing first, and that plans out your lights and your darks, and it plans out your composition and your your design of the page. Um, and I want those things to be very, very strong because everything you el else you do with painting is literally just icing on the cake and you're just more subtle layers of adding uh, things to it. Um, um, wait, uh, you said, what is it? What is the first thing you said that you do before the icing of the, on the cake and- Oh, Sorry. so drawing is just, is just design of the page. Okay. And your light source, right? Uh -huh. the, uh -huh. the biggest impacts are like the object you put on the page, where you put it on the page, mm -hmm. which is the design, and then how you lit it like yeah. the, the lighting source yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, those are your biggest like concerns. And then past that, everything else you're layering on top of it. Like if you if you had achieved, like you finished a drawing and then you transferred it over and started to make a painting out of it. Now you have to decide which of those marks is, um, you have to keep them as your light and your dark, but then you have to start deciding, are they more saturated? Are they less saturated? Yeah, yeah. Are they warmer? Are they cooler? Are they, you know, and then you can try to do tricky things like, um, <clears throat> like, Highlights and things are always warm, right? You would think like if you think of like 
light comes forward, blue goes back. Mm -hmm. So now you try to do tricky things in the painting. Like, can I get a light to come forward? Can like a, can I get like a bluish color to come forward and the reds to be the background? Can I, so that's what I mean by sophisticated palette, like things that, that aren't supposed to work, but you can kind of get them to work and they, they feel jarring or they have these emotional impacts that are a little different than just um, warm and cool. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that makes sense that one would try to it makes a lot of sense that one would try to make that kind of stuff work in a painting, because I'm pretty sure that is a that is a, that exists in nature sometimes. Yeah. Sure. Um, like, don't ask me when, but I'm pretty sure that I must have seen it sometime, because, for example, if you if you. It must happen, for example, like if you have a uh, snow scene in the night or something. Yeah. And uh, right. So then you, you have to sit to fight to make those because then you also want them to be naturalistic. You don't want them to be right. feel stuck on those those systems right. that you create to be stuck on. So then you find instances in nature when that thing would happen so that you get the opportunity to um, do that thing you were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm speaking about it very abstractly. But um, yeah, so exactly where, where your, your head went to is like, uh, oh, blues come like a highlight of blue could be like a, you know, a cold scene or a th mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But also uh, double lighting, like if you, um, I study movie lighting a lot to try to get some like ideas for things and how they feel emotionally. And, um, you know, there's that thing in a horror movie where um, it's like everything is like, like uh, normal kind of colors and then suddenly everything turns like a red filter. Mm -hmm. you know and the music comes in and it's like that's the oh shit that's you know the bad guy's coming or the thing is about to happen yeah, yeah. um those emotional cues um are, are fairly sophisticated uh and we don't know even notice them right like when you watch the film you you wouldn't scene by scene go like oh it turned all blue oh it turned kind of orange oh this scene was red or like but but they're keying the colors to make you feel like emotional things mm -hmm. and as painters and visual artists we don't we don't get to lay the the uh, music track on top and kind of which I feel like for a film, they kind of get to direct you when they put the music track on top and like, oh, this is a happy moment or like uh -huh. this is a sad moment or this is a contemplative moment or right? we, we don't we don't get to do that. But we do have control over those color things and um, stuff like that. And so that's just some stuff I've tried. I'm trying to work into my work is um, if I can use more of those uh, color emotional cues to kind of say what I'm trying to the feeling I'm trying to get across in the painting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, Stephen Assail. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a painter. I love Stephen Assail. Uh, yeah, he does. Um, he does a thing where he I mean, I didn't take painting classes with him. I took, I took drawing classes with him at the New York Academy of Art. But for his poor painting students, he has the model lit up with uh, and, you know, he does it in his paintings, too, where he has like one green light and one red light. And I mean, I figure is probably for that very study of the relationship between that stuff that you're talking about because i mean as of course you know as well that relationship of tones where a tone is really a tone when it is next to another tone that of course that exists also yep. with value range okay. exactly if you if you put a neutral gray next to white you would say it's a dark but if you right. put a neutral gray next to black you would say it's it's a light which right it's really neither it's just it's 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 all relative so it's what it's next to makes it stand out more but yes yeah i love steven sales work he new york guy uh he recently showed here in northern california and i got to see that uh his work for the first time in person because mm. uh, being on the west coast i don't i don't get a chance to see his stuff in person but i got to see some paintings in person it was very interesting um yes i don't know i don't know if he does painting demonstrations or drawing demonstrations like um wherever but i saw him painting and draw both painting and drawing like in person and it's just crazy how he does it yeah. um it's crazy but it's both crazy and ridiculous <laughs> how he does it because when he's painting he does the same where he like whips the the brush and it's like what are you doing yeah <laughs> i don't know it's weird it's it's weird and it's funny and it's <laughs> cool uh he's cool in the set uh, i really like him because i feel like he is just like always in the work zone work work zone because i mean mm -hmm. um you know that when you're in the work zone and you're like painting and stuff and somebody talks to you you're like what you yep. know you kind of can't talk he's like always there <laughs> yep. and it's like when he's lecturing he kind of he kind of talks like that and he 
as if he's talking right out of the warp zone and he's like if that makes any sense just like all the time because yeah. and i feel like he does that because anyway whatever um he's cool all right so um uh mr black what is art in your opinion well i love the scott mcleod um definition from his book understanding comics uh and it's it's like you know it's anything that you don't that that's past like food shelter clothing you know reproduction like mm -hmm. all the basic like human you know anything past that that's not like a, a necessity or we do like to um prolong the species like like so it's lots it could be lots of things mm -hmm. right um but i always try to do have it be something that's um i'm not i'm not i'm an okay writer i'm not not a great writer if i write something i don't know if people like get what i'm saying mm -hmm. um when i when i when i speak i feel like i'm not always heard um but when I make a painting and I hear someone come up to it and, um, you know, say like, oh my gosh, like this. And, you know, they noticed all the little things I'm trying to do. Uh, it's the first time that I feel like connected with another human being. So um, for me, it's, it's connection. Um, and it's also trying to um, just like entertain like other people, you know, when you're a little kid and you like you were the kid who could draw and you're mm -hmm. like, you know, you do it to entertain the other kids. And like, mm -hmm. now you're part of the tribe. Cause they're like, Oh yeah, that guy, like, yeah, keep him around. He's fun. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, why do you think art doesn't have, um, like what you were saying about the other things like food or shelter or reproductive type connections to human. I, I and, and, the... and what, like, what do you think that's a part of art? Uh, I think it's the simplest def like definition for it is it's 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 not it's not food it's not shelter it's not reproduction it's it's like it's like beyond that so it's it's kind of the measure of a society right like um you're all individual like hunter gatherers you kind of get together you form a society I think it's like it's the flower of a society so if the if the group of people and other things like is like nature and like um all these plants coming together like when they have everything working really well the flowering part of society is is creating art, is creating music and and film and and paintings and and poetry and like it's that stuff that's like the flower of you know of what we do. It's like it's not a this is the pretty stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Yes. But then why has it been around since the beginning? <laughs> oh, cause it, cause it holds, it holds a lot. I mean, you're, you're asking for a very big definition, but um, cause it, it fulfills many needs for us. Right. Like, uh, like I said, it's for me, it's, I feel like the most um, connected to another human being when I make something and they see it and they get what I was going for. Um, and they literally say the thing I was trying to get someone to see in the piece. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, it started at cave, you know, cave paintings or whatever. It started as like, uh, it's a form of communication. It's also a form of like diary. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, um, it's so many things, but, um, you, we get to it pretty quickly, right? As a, as an individual, you have to take care of your needs and then past your needs, everything you do that is like a creative thing. That's, that's the art of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to make, um, if you were making ceramics because you're making them for a function, um, this is a bowl. It's going to hold my food. Um, everything you do past its um, utilitarian purpose of mm -hmm. holding that food, like you, the the design on the side, um, the design of the bowl, the color of the like all those other, all those things past that utilitarian purpose are all art. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I guess I just feel like it insinuates. that it kind of doesn't, I mean, um, all right, give me a second. I mean, it's a super broad definition and that that's, I like that to be the, the most, that's the most simple definition is it's everything, it's everything past um, the simple needs stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's so many things to so many people. Um, and for me, one of the things that I, I try to do in my work um, is that I try to see uh, like beautiful things in, in um, creepy or throwaway stuff or, or things that someone wouldn't, uh, um wouldn't appreciate or mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you do that get... oh because i i'm so two reasons one is a very um <clears throat> uh egocentric um uh, 
idea is that like uh, like like a chef for instance if you take ingredients that are already amazing you have mm-hmm. to barely touch them right like you take like a like a steak that's uh you know like like some grade whatever the highest grade of steak or whatever you barely have to sear like a side of it mm-hmm. and someone will eat it and they'll go oh it's amazing right okay. so but if that same chef can take what they call like in british cook like what they call awful the bits of the animal that no one wants to eat mm-hmm. and you can somehow season it or do it in your craftsmanship you can make that stuff uh, to the point that it's just as delicious as that like super amazing ingredient, then you've really achieved something. So I, I always say like, if if you paint, if whoever paints a beautiful woman's face, you go, everyone's uh, response is going to be like, oh, she's really pretty. But if I can paint a severed head and your first response is, oh, she's really pretty. Like then, then I win. Like, mm-hmm. so I like to take creepy stuff and get people to like be emotionally connected to it and think that it's beautiful and that's that's just something that I get a kick out of Mm -hmm. and what makes that stuff what makes that stuff creepy to begin with uh I I mean creepy is like different for everybody um so people are crept out by like tryptophobia the fear of holes or uh, I recently made a painting called the lotus eater Um, which is a woman's face and the top half of it is turning into a lotus pod and the pods are popping out and um, taking it around to shows this year. uh, Lots of people have been triggered by the, their, their tryptophobia, which is um, uh, very present in the painting. Um, So that, I mean, that, that creeps people out, but it's going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just take things that are fascinating that I think are like kind of dark and creepy bits. And um, I like to make them pretty and and palatable uh, for people to be able to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's kind of that thing like uh, humor does the same thing, right? Like uh, there's certain religion and things like that you're not allowed to, like we don't talk about. But if you make it in the form of a joke, it's a little more palatable and people go like, oh, ha ha. You're like, okay, yeah. Like, you know, you can talk about more things in the form of humor than you can. So by making these things pretty, I get to talk about creepy subjects that I think are fascinating um, that maybe somebody else will be um, like uh, negatively like experience but I try to put uh, present them in a way that's pretty um, and that lets them look at them without um, the fear of that uh, instant re- repulsion mm-hmm. yes yes I guess and these I... are things these are also ideas that are like ever evolving because um, through the course of my work the things that I'm immediately drawn to like you don't always know why you're mm-hmm. like oh my sure. gosh I can't stop I can't stop looking at that thing um, like I'm very fascinated with the Pippa frog I don't know if you're familiar with that frog it's a frog that actually gives birth um through the holes on its back it's like there's pores in its back <laughs> mm-hmm. and um the like embryos are in the in the pores of the actual frog's like skin and mm-hmm. so when they hatch they all pop out of the skin it's very creepy and um it's disgusting it's what it is <laughs> see there you go so some people are yeah. very pop so but if you can present that in a beautiful way and someone can look at it without being re- uh, repulsed and then you can have a dialogue about this thing that I think I think is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Somebody else might be creeped out by, but um, yeah, yeah. So, I guess yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. So that that's those those are so it's an ever evolving relationship with the subject matter that I'm drawn to, and then me um, making it and presenting it and seeing how how people react to it, and then like my reaction of like why I'm drawn to those things and why I want to present them. And like, so I don't always have answers for all the things that I do, but um, that those are always changing and mm-hmm. you kind of improve on the other, the other thing you do in each piece is you keep trying to be a better you. Mm-hmm. So um, in terms of like, you keep stripping things away uh, to be, to present yourself. Like there's this idea of you and what you would want to do and you see it in your head. Um, but every piece like gets you a little closer to like trying to say exactly what you, you wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it changes all the time, but, but those are two things I've locked onto recently is, um, <clears throat> if I can take creepy things and make them pretty, then, uh, I somehow, um, won or am more skilled than someone who just takes like paints a rainbow and everybody goes like, Oh, it's a pretty rainbow. Mm-hmm. Like, of course it's pretty. It's a rainbow. Like, mm-hmm. but if I can paint like creepy shit and your first response is like, Oh, it's really beautiful. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not for me, but it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think I've done something. Um, I've achieved something a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then the second one is just, uh, I'm just trying to present these things that I'm fascinated and can't look away from um, and seeing who else is attracted to those things. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, yeah. It seems like um, it, 
when we were talking about the whole thing with the palette, it's like uh, trying to solve a problem or resolve a problem. So it's like you present the problem of, um, I don't know, Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> right. And you try to make a painting somehow that uh, talks about that. And then you want to try to make it, you know, beautiful for a person to look at that and be like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, so yeah. then it's like you pose a problem and then you try to solve the problem, basically. Does that seem right? Yes, 100%. But, yeah, it reminds also, me- like, at Working as a, as a designer, like the, before I did art full-time, mm -hmm. I was also working as a graphic designer, which I love the, the visual Tetris of, of problem solving um, in design. And so, um, and I also, I feel like the another thing I found recently of, of myself is I'm also very left-brained, um, meaning like I think more in terms of like I won't play the I won't play the game or start a painting or a drawing until I've figured like um, plan things out for myself because I'm too nervous to just jump in uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I need the playing field very carefully defined mm -hmm. uh, for me to then play the game, and then I feel comfortable and I'm free um, experimenting, exploring, and and like um, spending the time doing the thing but I have to very clearly define it first and so I think that that also comes with my design background of, of like very carefully like planning everything out um, and then there's I find fun in that but but to just jump in and be like here's a here's a blank canvas and like do whatever you want well then I'm I'm like I, I'm gonna be a freeze like I have no mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. but as soon as you start giving me rules like it has to be a blue piece mm -hmm. And it has to be about a queen and it has to be about like, oh my gosh, I, I could, I could do a million amazing things with that. Like, mm -hmm. but uh, to just have nothing to kick, like you need something to kick off of. Yeah. And uh, so like, I have to define the playing field before I start playing the game. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And I like that a lot in particular about the, the rules or a certain kind of a limitation, because I think what you just said about seeing a blank canvas or a blank piece of paper, um, just that is terrifying for a lot of people uh, because because of the freedom I guess uh, because it's like what okay it, you know you what am I supposed to do here what <laughs> you yep. know um and that that I mean I mean it's ter it's terrifying for a lot for a lot of people to the point where they just don't do anything at all and it's like, sure. you know, they call it the artist block or whatever, but it's like, no, it's just that you don't, you know, you, you don't have a path upon which to walk, you know? And um, I just, I, I guess I like what that says about some degree of restriction or rules when it comes to, if you paint, you should paint this way, or if you want to make the viewer feel this way, you should probably, you should consider at least, or start by using these colors you know, because uh, I just feel like it's very much in vogue and it's been in vogue for a long time to kind of talk down to that kind of stuff just because it's like, oh, the establishment or whatever you want to call it. And it's like, no, that's there for a reason. And it's there because it's useful for mm -hmm. a lot of people to do stuff. And it's like, if you think of like the people who chose to kind of stick to the rules, for example, of the French salon, it's like the paintings they make were fucking mind blowing. Are you kidding? And they had like all these rules. It's like they had to follow these rules in order to be, to be able to participate. If you didn't want to follow the rules, you don't participate. Easy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like if you want to follow a set of rules and it's like then you end up making this freaking amazing thing. It's like, OK, it was probably th in, in large part thanks to these specific. Um, you know, settings that you had to follow. Uh, no, the French, you your, make the work. Your, your example of the French salon is, is a perfect one um because they, they there was so so very rule bound mm -hmm. um but what you got out of that was um people like ang who um followed the rules like ex you know so extremely right like his drawing uh is amazing like yeah. every every square inch of those pieces is like a beautiful little um piece of light and um his draftsmanship is just incredible and then like yeah. the the layering of color on top of it, just, just amazing. And then what you get from that is, uh, you know, he was actually, Delacroix was actually a student of Aang. And so you get that rebellion of like, uh, he was trained to be that, that tight and specific and he pushed against it, had something to push against mm -hmm. and then makes all those romantic paintings of horses and things that are beautiful. And, and then the other thing you get out of that too, is you get someone who completely wants to run away from those rules, like, uh, um, like the impressionist, right? They, yeah. they were born out of like, uh, uh, poo-pooing the salon. So yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. but if you hadn't had that that setup first of like this is how you're supposed to do things, you wouldn't get either of those people. Like you wouldn't get the people who are trying to like achieve at very high levels within that system, or people who are trying to like push against it. So, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. Okay, 
Okay, um, Mr. Black, what is beauty in your opinion? Oh man, that's so like eye of the beholder sort of a sort of a thing, right? Like we've talked at length about like I love creepy creepy stuff, and mm -hmm. I think it's pretty. Um, so I don't know. It's like it's well, something that, that you didn't, you uh, didn't you, say you, that it you didn't say that it was pretty. You said that you try to make it pretty. I do well. Hopefully, I succeed and it's pretty. But mm -hmm. um, to but to me, they're pretty. Like uh, I can't stop looking away from the Pippa frog, and I think it's beautiful. Um, so stuff stuff like that. But but also it's um you know, it's that, it's that undefinable thing, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that moment you stand in front of a piece and you're, it's the words are cliche because you, you, you can't describe that feeling like mm -hmm. very well, but people, you know, in terms of like pe that people have, have tried is like, uh, takes your breath away or you're like frozen in the moment or like, like those kind of things when you, um, like the first time I got to stand in front of like a real Dali painting was just like, that was a moment that was like, that was a, a very important moment. Like I loved him since I was a little kid and like finally getting to see them in person was like, you know, those, those things like breathtaking and like frozen. And like, I just stood there forever, like looking at every little, little thing. And, um, and it's very undefinable, right? Uh, the the idea know. of the idea of beauty, it's either, you know, it's, it's something you're drawn to and something that you, um, you know, crave. It's like sugar, right? Like you're like, like, Oh, sure. Like, like you, mm -hmm. for me anyway, I visually, visually appealing, like aesthetically ap appealing things are, um, I'm constantly devouring and like looking out for like new things that I find visually interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, so when you were talking, um, I don't remember during, I think during the art part, um, you know, when you were talking about making creepy things, I don't know, do, before I ask you about art, making creepy things to be beautiful or pretty or or have the viewer not be able to look away from them and this type of stuff. Um, my work has also been described as, you know, quote unquote, dark, um, whatever these words are. And I have always been really prickly about that. And I'm so prickly about it that I get prickly about it when another artist describes their work that way, because I'm like, no, don't submit. <laughs> you know, and the reason is, I guess, you know, I bring it up in, I guess, this part, because I, I think that it's related. Um, I don't think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And I think that is kind of like limited in a way, because, of course, everyone has their own personal taste. But I think mm -hmm. there's more in common than there is in different, uh, you know, different. And I think, for example, because uh, I love uh, not just artistic anatomy, but I like regular medical anatomy, mm -hmm. for example. Sure. And, um, you know, lots of people get just kind of repulsed and disgusted by this kind of stuff because it's a dead body, it's a corpse, whatever. Um, but, or, you know, in the case of the Pippa frog, like you were saying, um, or bugs, whatever a person might think is creepy or disgusting. I refuse to use the term dark or creepy for those that type of stuff because I just think the way they work is so cool yeah you know I mean just and for example like the, just something that's more uh, conventional something that's we're more familiar with just like the human body the human body is so weird it's like it's like I it's like I personally don't really understand why we're out there trying to look for aliens when the body is alien <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. if you look at a skull and like the shape of the sockets and like the 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 other holes that are behind the sockets through which like the nerves and stuff the muscle musculature comes out and stuff and it's like what you know, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like people will look at that stuff and they're you know, like you were saying they're kind of repulsed by it. They, they think it's creepy they're weirded out they think of death and this stuff and it's like I mean yeah that can be part of that, but at the same time you can't deny that this stuff is amazing and you can't deny that it's stuff that you're a part of it's like you're a part of you're connected to you have a skull okay mm -hmm. and you're not that different from the pippa frog in a way because you're alive and you're a creature of earth it's like you know nature made you in this stuff so it's like it's like finding that commonality and that very close connection with stuff um i think I don't know. I I kind of I kind of think that's um very closely somehow and I don't know how, but somehow closely related to 
the sense of awe that one feels when experiencing beauty. And like in the case of beauty, I am not entirely sure that it's necessarily like an, a, a visual appearance thing. I, uh, and, and I've been thinking that it's kind of like a, something that one experiences like a feeling um, because that's yeah, what make yeah. But they have to be, um, as a visual artist, which you, you are a visual artist, um, sure. you're, you're still having to use visual cues, um, whether that means like um, drawing realistically or drawing crudely on purpose to get those uh, things, but you still have to use visual cues um, to get the person to feel what, what it is you're trying to express. Right. Um, so. Oh, no, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, of course, I, I kind of have no but choice. There's a, <laughs> there's a visceral like there's a there's a there's a term in art art um cr criticism that that i love and i hate um but it works it just works well so i use it um as a visceral reaction visceral uh, to a, visceral reaction yeah. to a painting mm -hmm. so when someone walks up in their stand in front of a painting and they they almost want to drop to their knees or they um are just like so taken by the piece that they might like faint a little or or um, forget themselves that they're in a public space and they kind of make a, you know, like, oh my God, you know, like they, they wouldn't walking around the whole museum, mm -hmm. they would keep this sort of composure, right? But when they get to this, a certain painting that really hits them, there's this visceral reaction where they, they forget they're in a public space and they might get louder. Uh, they might cry. Um, they might smile. Like they might throw up their hands, like, um, you know, joyously. They might, like, mm -hmm. yeah, there might be like a lot of visceral. There's like a, there's like a physical reaction in them that the visual experience of the painting caused. And ultimately you would love to have that in every, every piece that you create, right. For that, for it to be that important and that impressive, like to, uh, to a viewer. Mm -hmm. And that happens like a lot of different ways. It happens in, uh, someone might be like very impressed with like the the design of the page or the lighting of the thing or a certain color like you know uh sets off a, a feeling for them or um you know and then it's and it's also a symphony right it's like it's the combination of all of those things that you planned out um that kind of crescendo into that visceral reaction in the viewer that they really have a, a deep like connection with the piece mm -hmm. or at least you know you try for that every time yes i like that as part of um, what I was musing about as the kind of like the experience of beauty, because um, it, I mean, you know, you know how they talk about tunnel vision for whatever things, mm -hmm. it kind of makes me think of that where say that, you know, you're looking at the work and you the can- The world drops away. Yeah, you stop paying attention to everything else because for yeah. whatever, for whatever reason, the all of the attention has now been hyper-focused upon this work. Mm -hmm. And you're having like, you know, the viewer is having like this exchange with the work. So, I mean, I think that experience, I think that experience of beauty is basically the same for everyone. And I, and I mean, I like the idea that it's the same for everyone. And I mean, I agree. Yeah. Of course, I agree with the visual part uh, because I kind of have no choice, but I, uh, <laughs> but I kind of agree with it. And uh, because, uh, because I think that it is a conduit to the experience. I don't think the visual part is necessarily the experience of beauty because I think the experience happens. I think it's more than I think it's more than that. I think it's yeah. that's just a fraction of the whole experience. You know, does that there, seem right? I think so. Yeah, they're triggers, right? Yeah. So the same same with like when you listen to a melancholy song, um, but it makes you happy. Mm -hmm. um, and it shouldn't like like if you would if you were to think like just uh basically like like oh a very melancholy song like would make you sad and like no sometimes uh it's good to feel the feels and then you're and you you get through the tunnel of that feeling and then you're happy because of that uh melancholy song right so um but if you were to if you were to kind of break down the song and like well why is it in a certain key is it this is that like well um it's just a trigger right so so visual visual cues and things in art can just be a trigger for someone. Um, and sometimes those triggers are different. They're definitely different for everyone, but they feel the same in the moment for sure. Mm -hmm. It's that that moment where the rest of the world drops away and you're just experiencing that thing. And um, it, it's a trigger for then you to feel more deeply. Um, and I think that happens in, uh, happens in food, right? It happens in food a lot. So like, let's say there was like, your mom always made you like this specific lasagna as a kid. If you taste that lasagna again, you're going to be right back to that childhood mm -hmm. feeling of like, you know, and have that everything drops away and you're just like, oh my gosh, this, you know, amazing moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so it can, ha the triggers can happen with lots of things. And it's, it's usually like a memory kind of a thing. And, 
Um, a lot of times when I paint a specific thing, like I'm going, I, I'm trying to get an, uh, a response in the viewer or trying to say a specific thing. But I used to get bummed if um, I set up a system and I was trying to say something. And when the viewer saw it, they interpreted, they would tell me like, oh, it's about this, right? Mm -hmm. And they would interpret it in a different way. And I was like, oh, I guess, well, I guess I, I failed. failed. They, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't get the thing that I was. And mm -hmm. um, lately, I'm more excited to let people live in the piece. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, so I can have an intention of why I made it, but if the things I set up trigger that cue in people that they connect to it very deeply and it, it it's uh, also meaningful for them. And if that's in a slightly different way than the way I meant it, then that's okay. 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 Well, uh, I like that a lot to start closing it out because uh, Mr. Black, we have broken the 50 minute mark of our conversation. So I'm gonna start closing it out as these are usually about an hour long. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me uh, today, Mr. Stephen Black. Yeah, well, um, thanks for having me. And I, I really appreciate um, getting fun questions and, and uh, more deeper questions than what kind of pencil you use and what kind of paint you like and <laughs> yes. those kind of, so thank you. Of course, yeah, no, you're very welcome. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let um, Stephen and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments. I encourage you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals as it, as it helps the channel. And this way more people can listen to these interviews. Finally, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because I have more conversations scheduled. If you want, if you want to support Stephen, myself, this podcast or all three, the links will be in the show notes. And actually, <laughs> Stephen, I forgot. Um, is there anything uh, you're working on currently? You have a show coming up. Where can people find your work? Yeah. So if you live in the Bay Area, uh, which is where I live, you can you can come pop up. the. I, I do all kinds of pop-up shows on the weekends. And um, you can see me in person, and I bring my paintings around. Um, and otherwise, just my website, stephenrussellblack.com. Uh, and then I'm just branded all over social media, Stephen Russell Black. You can find me like all, 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 on all the different social medias. Um, and the thing I'm excited about right now is I'm, I'm painting a bunch of stuff for Monster Palooza next month. So um, I'll be in LA uh, and Burbank for the Son of Monster Palooza show. And the thing I just finished is the new tarot card set that's going to be on my website in October. Oh, nice. So um, I ran a Kickstarter for it and it's successfully funded. And um, we're very excited to get it back from the printer next month. That's awesome. Lots of stuff too. Nice work. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. So then, well, um, thank you everyone for watching and thank you again, Stephen. And, um, well, see you, see you everyone next time. Bye.